Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet everyone here. And thank you, uh, Karen and Lian, for the opportunity. Thank you, Rizwan, for agreeing to this chat. And uh, before we, went, we go into it, I just wanted to say it's been fantastic to listen to all the pitches. Um, it's fantastic to hear um, such amazing things that women are doing for other women. So like that maternity testing, the financial inclusion piece, that's it's all great. And uh, good luck to everyone while, uh, while the judges do their crunching. Um, Rizwan, I think uh, how we're gonna go ahead with this is uh, maybe we can talk a little bit. I can ask you a few questions about Lab One or you can ask me a few questions if you wanted to know a little bit. So, so thank you. Thank you for having uh, me as part of this program. Uh, fantastic presentation by all the companies and, and very uh, uh, insightful a question from all the judges. Uh, Farah, uh, thank you for spending your Saturday. I know it is it's Saturday. Uh, it, it, where I am, this is still not Saturday, although I am in Malaysia. Uh, I'm still in my office. No, no I'm joking. <laughs> uh, what I want to ask uh, Farah, because I think Labuan has been uh, really uh, not in the attention of many. I know there are some companies who are uh, I mean, they know about Labuan, they, they probably heard about Labuan, but connecting Labuan and FinTech and how they can leverage on Labuan, that's a very interesting topic to me in terms of how uh, today our audience and everybody is here to understand. Uh, and before we go into that, uh, just to ask you, because you are the, the person who live and breathe Labuan for the last, I mean, you are born for Labuan, I know that, Farah. <gasps> But how, how has uh, Labuan, uh, especially in your role, been uh, the last six months? Because this is really something different. And, and how are you guys coping in terms of the growth, the challenges and opportunities that you see? And what's the plan going forward? Yeah. Thanks, Rizwan. So, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about Labuan is that it's not just fintech-centric, it's digital-centric. So we embrace everything digital. It can be fintech, it can be um, anything that is DLT related. Um, the last six months has been excruciatingly um, demanding. So because we've had the COVID situation, uh, we've had challenges there, we've had to ensure that it's business as usual as possible uh, in our one for, for all our players. So, you know, um, including, including the digital guys. Um, but we've seen growth. We've seen tremendous growth in our bond. And the conventional side, so we've got new insurance licenses, new banking licenses, new companies, but also the digital side. So today, we have about 50 digital license holders. Um, and, and it keeps growing uh, at, at this kind of a click. Um, really, growth is there because the market understands that there is an opportunity uh, to be part of a center that um, embraces the ethos of digital. So number one, right, it's not jurisdictionally confined. When you're in Lab One, you don't have to uh, necessarily focus only on the Malaysian market. It can be any market, right, first. Secondly, um, it is well regulated, okay? Thirdly, and fundamentally, the ethos is that we accept that digital is nothing new in the greater scheme of things. The ethos is that digital is a new way of doing business. And if nothing else, COVID has shown us that, right? Um, because it's a new way of doing business and because we're a wholesale intermediation center um, that's jurisdictionally agnostic, currency agnostic, what we can do is to have players come into us and tell us, Look, listen, this is our business plan and this is the digital element in it. Which of your licenses can we use? So we have had tremendous growth in everything from um, securities ex exchange licenses. So we, for example, um, and this is a really bespoke license where you are able to set up your own exchange with your, as an own listing venue. So recently, uh, we had the first one launched uh, last year, which is Fusang Exchange. And then recently, we licensed uh, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. So the Gibraltar Stock Exchange is already in existence in Gibraltar, but chose Labuan to actually uh, spearhead its Asian expansion. 
right? And also we have uh, crypto exchanges. That's and we use the money broking license um, because we accept that crypto as a form of storage of value is uh, almost is equivalent to fiat, right? The question is. Um, is society, is the existing legacy infrastructure, are they willing to accept that, right? But for as long as the check and balances within the business unit and within the business operations can um, accommodate that and the regulators are comfortable with that, um, we will license uh, entities like this. So, you know, we, what we, our approach is very much uh, non-sandbox. Our approach is very much pick and mix in the sense that you can develop uh, a solution. So we've got, for example, exchanges that use our money broking license as a trading platform, our payment gateway approval, right, and our credit token license to issue their own tokens. So with those three elements, what you have is um, a, a full-fledged uh, uh, startup exchange, uh, you know, for the digital space. So we've seen a lot of growth. Your question with regards to um, challenges is what I'd like to talk about. And so, of course, the perennial banking issue is there, mm. um, have no doubt. Yep. Um, and if anything, actually, COVID has made it worse um, because everyone is so much more risk averse than they used to due mm. to the basic, you know, uncertainty in the situation. Yep. So challenges is that, number one, for sure. Uh, second thing, also, we believe that in a lot of the startups, um, and the ones that we've spoken to is that they've had a withdrawal of funding. Uh, so normally what happens is that when they come to us, they've already started, there's already the POC, uh, you know, they've, they've moved from their angel and they want to scale up, right? So for example, Igloo, um, that was Azinan, that is now Series A in Singapore, license was, is a licensed insurtech in Labuan. Right, uh, they're doing a lot of financial inclusion work everywhere, and and they're a great bunch of people. But the point is, they manage and they came to Labuan already at a certain scale. Mm. Now the issue is in the pipeline. You know, because the pipeline is um, a little bit there's a kink in the pipeline, as it were. So what has happened is that there is a slowdown in these companies, these beautiful companies with great POCs um, that really have a use case. Um, you know, there's a kink in that, in that, in that pipeline. Um, so, you know, I hope we don't, we, I hope that kink resolves itself. I hope there is funding because, you know, in order to come to Labuan, you have to already have a particular size as it were. Um, so it could be for all intents and purposes, the winner today, um, after they get their, their angels, more angels come in and their VCs come in, come to Labuan to actually uh, scale up their operations. Fantastic. Thank you, Farah. I think, I think that's, that's clear in terms of uh, the value proposition that Labuan has uh, and the suitability and the readiness of certain size and maturity that whatever company, especially those who are embracing uh, digitalization, uh, to think about Labuan. Uh, but just to be a little bit more I mean, deep in terms of, uh, is there any particular avenue for less mature company to use Labuan? I mean, I, I know that you mentioned that uh, it is preferable that you have uh, POC ready or at least MVP and, and all those stuff. But for, for companies that probably are in between, maybe they just pass the seat uh, and then trying to prove themselves and, and you know now, because if you don't scale fast, uh, you will not be able to uh, have a clear path to profitability. So just share with us, if, if, is there any room for less mature, uh, but company that probably have created an MVP uh, that could think or use Labuan as a, as, a, as a ground for them to then scale faster? No, absolutely. Um, I think there is a, a kind of a romantic relationship between international financial centers and um, the philosophy of digital, right? And, and this, is, this is something I tell everyone I meet. Um, we were brought into this space kicking and screaming. Um, we, we were not comfortable uh, dealing with um, my most favorite 
space now, which is you guys, um, because it's something that's unknown to us. You know, I've been called the, the woman from the legacy uh, side, as it were, like almost the dark side, you know. Um, but I think this, this is the thing. There's a, there's a natural romantic relationship between the two. There's a symbiotic relationship be between the two um, because the philosophy is a very open philosophy, first. Secondly, however, there is an, a perennial issue, and the issue is this. The guys doing the tech, the guys doing the DLT and using the blockchain and using the apps, the, the interface, whatever, the programmers, you know, the technicians, as it were, they are not uh, corporate technicians. So they don't understand that actually you can, instead of a box standard domestic company, set up a love on company, right? Um, that immediately will allow uh, foreign ownership, currency neutrality, um, ease of exchange of shares so that you can then start uh, 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 divvying up equity uh, for, for, for cash, you know, for input, for, for uh, drawdown. It is about understanding how you can use Labon as a corporate player, not necessarily a digital player, okay? So what I discussed earlier was very much about, oh, we have licenses that you can use. And yes, you're right. You have to have a certain level of maturity in order to appreciate what that actually means. But even before that, what you can do as a digital player and, and, and jurisdictionally agnostic, okay, is the fact that you can set up a box standard Labon company. Right, nothing fancy, just a box standard Labon company, which will be able to not only give you a tax advantage, will be give, will be able to give you flexibility in equity uh, splitting, shareholding, stuff like that. Okay, we also have had people come in and set up a fund, a private fund in Labon, right, where you know instead of going direct to the VC, there is also another element, another layer of some management. Right, so a digital, basically a digital fund manager where the mandate is based on creating sustainable digital uh, uh, um, graduates as it were, but you know, you're using a love one fund, for example, right? You can also, uh, instead of using, uh, use a partnership. So in Labon, we have partnerships. So instead of setting up a fund, you could have a limited liability partnership with a general, uh, general partner. These are actually very box standard corporate structures. Box standard. There is nothing stopping anybody in the digital space using these structures. The only thing that is stopping um, usage is um, awareness. And I guess this is where you know um, we come in to try and uh, get everyone to understand um, and appreciate Labon a bit more. Fantastic. I mean, that's exactly the purpose why you and I are having a chat because I think it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a uh, lack of awareness about how Lab One actually can play, in my opinion, a very significant role in having uh, a, an early corporate strategy, even for a, a, a startup. And, and having yeah, no, said that, yeah. Sorry, I just, I just want to add one other point, right? So the first time I went to a conference um, in this space is what was token 2049. Um, and the number of guys out of Hong Kong are all licensed, are all registered their companies in the Seychelles, mm. okay? So the issue here is this, right? When you start using offshore centers like Seychelles and stuff like that, there isn't that reputational uh, plus plus to it. So when you want to scale up, the VC guys are going, or PE guys are going to come in and cut you off at least 30%. Right? So you've got to think a little bit long term as you are developing your POC. Yes, you know, the programming, the tech and everything, that's great. But really at the end of the day, right, Apple is not going to be Apple if they didn't have a whole slew of corporate advisors talking to them. Right? It's only sustainable when it makes money. And it makes money because there's planning in the corporate structure. Precisely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's why... I, I'm very eager to share because now when let's let's be a little bit deeper in terms of uh, when you start a company, the company may be originating from Malaysia. Yes. The company may be uh, trying to scale uh, from Malaysia, whether they are originally from Malaysia or just part, or they are just passing through Malaysia, where they have the client facing maybe in Hong Kong, Singapore, or anywhere in the world but the back office and the middle office is based in Malaysia. Because if I have a, if I have a company, 
logically Malaysia should be the back office because of its low cost yes. uh, 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 neutrality. So, so share with us how could uh, these three different uh, situations uh, take advantage of or can use Labuan, as you said just now, because if let's say I'm just passing through, I have somewhere uh, else uh, that is using, uh, say, Singapore, Hong Kong as, as customer facing, how could Labuan play a role? And plus the other two as well in terms of uh, scaling up or sure. even you are originating from Malaysia. Sure. So I'll take the Malaysia one last because I think that that will probably be a bit, a bit more interesting. Let me explain to you the pass through, as you call it. Um, for example, the guys that ran the tech for the Malta exchange, which was deemed the first digital exchange, did it via a Labon company, the two Aussie boys. They did it via a Labon company, and that's completely passed through. Okay? Yep. Yep. So the, it was a Labon company, two Australians, um, set up New Dawn, I think they're called, um, and JV with a, with a Malta exchange. They, they, they uh, serviced them in the sense that they provided the tech behind the platform and that was done via a love one company. So two Aussies, one love one company, multi exchange. So that's complete pass through. Okay. Now the other, ex the other explanation is let's say your markets are in Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever, ASEAN wide. Um, and you're dealing with uh, you're dealing with in 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 whatever business whatever application as it were. Um, a classic example is 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 Igloo Asena, right? So they are all over. They're in Philippines and Thailand. The last time I spoke to uh, Wei, he was doing something in I don't know Papua New Guinea or something like that. That is that is a loved one licensed insurtech. HQ, Singapore, operations everywhere in Asia. Okay? That, that is the second real case study. Now, the third, as a Malaysian, now, the Malaysia, there is no restriction for a Malaysian, i.e. passport holder, resident, um, to open a Labuan company. Okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think there is, but there isn't. I mean, the, uh, Labuan was first set up to benefit Malaysians leaving Malaysia, okay? Yeah. So there's no, there's no restriction. Um, the restriction that comes in is when you start trying to sell your products to non, what we call non-qualified investors in Malaysia. That is where we will come to you in your business plan, you will have to then go to the Securities Commission or Nagara and get their approval to enter the Malaysian market as it were. For non-qualified, what is deemed in the financial world wholesale or large investors, right? So there is nothing stopping a Malaysian uh, programmer, a Malaysian technical technician, I, I grapple at what they call themselves, but a developer um, from using a Malaysian company to not only market and develop and grow uh, themselves um, regionally, but also in Malaysia, and the caveat is that you cannot uh, sell to domestic, Malaysian domestic retail uh, users. Then you have to go to the, to, to the jurisdictional uh, competent authority, which is either the SEC of Malaysia or Negara. Yes, that's true. So, so basically, uh, based on the profile of the company, the nine companies today, there's a lot of opportunities for them to really have a, 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 a deeper chat with uh, Labo and IVFC, especially with yourselves, to understand how it could help them either uh, fundraising or scale themselves through Labuan and explore uh, a, a better structure in terms of managing costs, especially in multi-currency situation. Uh, so yeah, because based on my little experience running a multi-currency uh, business, uh, you, you would have to pay a lot of money if you have a, a FCA onshore in Malaysia, yes. compared to if you uh, set it up uh, based on uh, what you said just now, as long as you are not uh, dealing on a, a C2C basis uh, and yeah. dealing in ringgit as well uh, for, for, for your business. So it's, it's pretty clear that there is actually 
uh, quite an advantage in terms of how Labuan could be uh, a useful uh, platform uh, for companies, be it digital, be it fintech, or even if you're brick and mortar in terms of using Labuan uh, as a place for you to scale your business, particularly in terms of using it as part of your corporate strategy. I think that's, that's the part where a lot of companies are, are probably not uh, aware of, especially at the beginning of the business. Uh, and they were thinking more about uh, focusing on the technology, the, the feature of their product. Uh, and, and, and yet, uh, they, they should already have been thinking about how to scale. And this is uh, where I think Lab One could play a very significant role uh, for them uh, in helping uh, to chart their path to profitability. Uh, I would love to hear or get questions from people who attend, uh, even the companies. Uh, I, I think the question just now was about uh, the, the tension between China and US and, and how uh, that, if there's, I think, I think that question was alluding to prior to COVID. I think Labuan was very aggressive in terms of marketing in China, uh, having a lot of company coming from China. Uh, I think one of the bank actually was given somewhat like a, a digital uh, platform capabilities. So just share with us, what, what is uh, the strategy in terms of managing uh, that particular tension between those two name countries just now? If if there is any concern as far as Labuan is concerned, as far as I, I'm concerned, I don't think uh, there should be any concern, but just, uh, I mean, addressing that question, yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. My biggest concern is when I can go and buy everyone in China another meal because that's, <laughs> when, that's fundamental in doing yeah. business in China. And yes, I do miss uh, all our Chinese peers and, 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 and counterparts. I think the trade tension issue is hugely political. I think on the ground, it's business as usual. People want to trade, people want to make money, people understand the value of each other, what both parties bring to the table. Um, we have not seen necessarily a, a huge slowdown uh, from China. Um, the problem, my personal problem, is that I'm unable to really market develop new areas in China. So it's more, you know, just, just working existing uh, flows, but nothing new in that sense. Um, I think it's overrated. I wanted to go back, if I may, uh, a little bit about the potential. So there is a, there's another thing that I, I actually had wanted to talk to you about, Rizwan, but because you've been so busy. Um, I'm not. I'm not busy. You are. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, I'm the one. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so let's not go there. Uh, do you know that all fintechs and all digital players have a problem with insurance? Because people don't understand the risk. I mean, when I say people, the underwriters, the reinsurers, the insurers, yeah, yeah, yeah. what they tend to do is bulk it together with cyber. And you and I both know that cyber's got nothing to do with digital, right? Um, and one of the things I think fintech, the fintech associations across Asia could look at is our protected cell company structure, where the fintech, for example, the, the protected cell at the core, so the Malaysian Fintech Association could set up a protected cell company and then become your own self-insurance vehicle and provide your members or you know, whoever would like to come in a really cheap, basic risk management insurance cover. You know, and, and again, I go back to the issue of value yep. upon exit. Yep. Right? Um, in that huge corporate flow, what you want is to be able to show when you exit or when you capital raise that you have thought about risk. And yet risk is so expensive, especially in this day and age. It's yeah. such a hard market. Um, and really all, all, the, all the startups want is something basic. Collectively, as a community, and I feel the digital fintech community is so open, I love it. You're able, and, and that's important because when you're starting to look at risk, you need that openness in order to be able to assess uh, uh, industry-wide risk. Um, I think it's a great opportunity um, to allow, you know, to really push and, and give Malaysian fintech companies or digital companies that comfort. 
So that's okay. another way we're happy to work with the FinTech Association or anybody out there looking to try and cover this space. Yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, uh, I think what, what I'm going to do is this is very interesting in terms of uh, uh, creating that awareness that we have a jam here in, in Labon, as well as what we have on shore, uh, given yes. and, and now uh, developed by all the regulators and all the mm -hmm. key stakeholders. And, and made it possible for uh, the mushrooming of a lot of fintech companies. So what I'm going to conclude is what we're going to do is we need to, to be able to uh, do a, an effective storytelling because that's what Singapore and Hong Kong is good at. And the, 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 the concern that people have with the uncertainty, especially political uncertainty in Hong Kong, uh, and, and this is probably an opportunity for us to push forward the story that Malaysia has, which is the onshore plus the midshore plus the, the Islamic market as well, that yeah. it, it creates Malaysia and, and provide an opportunity, an abundance of opportunity for many type of businesses, especially digital businesses. So I would love if all participants today or, or anybody who who wants to know more to get in touch with myself, with Farah, and as well as with SLT, uh, and explore this opportunity because there's a lot of it. And, and I think it is uh, very fortunate of us to spend our Saturday and, and get to know this kind of opportunity and knowledge. Uh, and thank you, Farah, for, for your time uh, talking with me. I, I know that I always talk nonsense with you, but uh, thank you for today, I mean, addressing all the questions that I asked you. And thank you, Sue Ann, for, for having both of us uh, uh, during this chat. Uh, and and uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in. Thank you very much. So, so can I just say one thing? Yes. There's a lot that can come out from nonsense. So, <laughs> of course. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All thank right. you for your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Farah. Thank you, Rizal.